I want you to hit me as hard as you can. If you're a fan of Joe Blow, you're very familiar with the Marvel Cinematic Universe, a saga that encompasses and eclipses the world of film. With 23 and soon to be 24 films that have collectively grossed almost $25 billion at the box office, the MCU stormed Hollywood, solidifying the superhero film as its own genre. Even though they've noticeably received flack for not being quote-unquote real cinema, the box office, audience scores, and critics' reviews don't lie. Marvel has created a cinematic giant. Amongst that giant, perhaps a little difficult to see, is Ant-Man, one of the more popular characters in the history of Marvel Comics. Created in 1962 by Stan Lee, Jack Kirby, and Larry Lieber, Ant-Man, also known by his civilian name Hank Pym, was a biophysicist who became a superhero after discovering a chemical substance, which he called Pym Particles, that would allow him to shrink down in size. Throughout his appearances in Marvel Comics, Ant-Man was the little engine that could. In fact, if you look in the comics at the founding members of the Avengers, Ant-Man is in there, somewhere. He was one of the five founding members. If you look through Marvel's biggest moments, Ant-Man is there, if you squint. Even one of the most successful story arcs in Marvel Comics history, The Age of Ultron, only took place because of Hank Pym, who unfortunately was the creator of Ultron. So when we talk about the MCU, its impact on cinematic history, and the Avengers, the centerpiece of the franchise, perhaps the most amazing thing is that Ant-Man ever made it in. The main reason he did wasn't because of his history in the comics, or being a founding member of the Avengers. It wasn't even for creating one of Marvel's most notorious monsters. It was because of the passion one filmmaker had for the character. And unfortunately, that filmmaker wasn't the filmmaker that brought him to life on the big screen. Hey, at least it got made, right? But that's not all. With the behind-the-scenes drama between a studio and its director, cast and crew dropping from the production like flies, or ants, and a decade's worth of delays and rewrites, you gotta ask yourself, what the f happened to this movie? To take a legitimate look at what happened, we have to go way back. We have to go back to a time before the universe. Ah, too far. Ugh, god no. Farther back. Yep, right around here. In the late 1980s, Stan Lee had pursued ways to expand Marvel Comics into other forms of media. After all, the comic book audience at the time would only go so far. How could he introduce his properties to audiences that had never heard of them? In this regard, he actually had surprising success with The Incredible Hulk, which started as a TV show in the late 1970s through early 80s, then went on to see mild success with a few made-for-TV movies, all starring Bill Bixby and Lou Ferrigno. Along with this and a few other projects, Lee had become obsessed with seeing Ant-Man make it to the big screen. He loved the character beyond all reason, while others in Hollywood and the comic world alike couldn't seem to care less. Boaz Yakin, who partnered with Stan Lee to write 1989's The Punisher, starring Dolph Lundgren, was once quoted saying, He wanted an Ant-Man script in the worst way. I had been arguing against Ant-Man because, let's face it, he can shrink down, go through a keyhole, and look at secret papers in a desk drawer. And that's it. Marvel's parent company at the time, no, not Disney, briefly put Ant-Man into development, but quickly gave up on the project. It wouldn't be brought up or spoken of again until the year 2000. That year, Artisan Entertainment forged a partnership with Marvel to bring many of its franchises to the big screen, with promises of making a TV series for Thor, Son of Odin, and films for the likes of Captain America, Black Panther, Deadpool, Iron Fist, and Morbius, along with a few other barely mentioned characters, like Longshot, Power Pack, and Mort the Dead Teenager? Hidden somewhere within those properties was Ant-Man. Within a year, Edgar Wright entered the picture, Edgar Wright was best known at the time for his hit British TV series Spaced, starring Simon Pegg and Nick Frost. Once he was finished with production on the series, he began taking meetings with Artisan in the hopes that he would develop an adaptation for Marvel. As a result of those meetings, he and writer Joe Cornish started developing a treatment for Ant-Man. It starred a version of the character named Scott Lang instead of Hank Pym, and its focus was meant to be drastically different from other superhero films of the time. While the genre seemed to offer quite a bit in the way of big-budget action and adventure, Wright and Cornish imagined their film to be more of a crime drama, but with Wright's signature sense of humor sprinkled throughout. Artisan ultimately passed on the treatment that the two had worked up, saying they were looking for a more family-friendly property than what was put to paper. Ant-Man was, once again, dead before it had a chance to grow. In 2004, Edgar Wright actually met Kevin Feige, 
Now, it has to be mentioned, this was pre-Disney Feige, so the MCU wasn't in existence yet. But Feige still had his hands on just about everything Marvel-related in Hollywood. From X-Men to Spider-Man to Daredevil, Hulk, The Punisher, and even Blade Trinity, Kevin Feige was the man any filmmaker would have wanted to meet at the time if they had hoped to make a Marvel film. So when Feige asked Wright if he'd be interested in developing such a film, imagine his surprise to hear that Wright had already done just that. As it turned out, Feige and Marvel studio head Avi Arad had never even heard about Wright's Ant-Man treatment, but once they saw it, they were thrilled. They asked Wright and Cornish to begin writing a script. At around the same time, Marvel received a loan from Merrill Lynch for $525 million to begin producing major movie adaptations of ten of their characters. Among those characters was Edgar Wright's adaptation of Ant-Man. Then came Comic-Con 2006. In one of the smaller halls in San Diego's convention center, not even the famous Hall H, Marvel Studios hosted their first Comic-Con panel, where they discussed the future of Marvel films. On stage along with Feige was John Favreau discussing the development of Iron Man, Louis Leterrier talking about The Incredible Hulk, and Edgar Wright talking about Ant-Man. These were the three films that were chosen to be represented on stage in front of the world when Marvel dropped a game-changing bomb, a shared cinematic universe. At the time, it was unimaginable. It was at this Comic-Con that Wright laid out in interviews what direction the film was taking. It was still planned to focus on Scott Lang, but there would be moments where you would see Hank Pym in action as Ant-Man in the 1960s. Then eventually, the two would cross paths. The following year, after Hot Fuzz was released, Wright and Cornish turned in their first draft of the script, focusing on Lang, Pym, Pym's daughter Hope Van Dyne, and a villain who would use an upgraded version of the Ant-Man suit called the Nano Warrior. Then things got quiet. For a few years, actually. The only news reported was that revisions were being done to the script. Never a good sign for a film that was announced at Comic-Con. Rumors began spreading that the film was in trouble. Edgar Wright, to his credit, dismissed the rumors, saying the film was simply in a holding pattern. Since Ant-Man wasn't seen as one of the tentpole properties in the Marvel Universe, there was no need to rush it into production. Just when it seemed like interest in the film was dwindling, Stan Lee himself came to the rescue and tweeted out, I had lunch with the cool young director Edgar Wright, and as you'd imagine, we had fun discussing the tiny hero. Ant-Man is just one of the many wild treats Marvel has planned for you. For fans, a tweet of this magnitude was like Marvel itself having a mouth and speaking. The Ant-Man movie was coming, for sure. Cut to July of 2010 at San Diego Comic-Con. Four years after Edgar Wright first spoke about the film on stage, alongside discussions of Iron Man and The Incredible Hulk, both of which had come out in 2008, Marvel unveiled the cast of The Avengers, the centerpiece to all Marvel films. Feige's vision that was discussed in 2006 had come to fruition, and while audiences were ecstatic to see the big screen arrival of their favorite superhero team, Ant-Man was not involved. He wasn't even mentioned. Wright, at the time, chalked it up to the chronology of the stories. What Ant-Man was doing simply wouldn't fit into Marvel's timeline, or at least at that point. The following year, Wright and Cornish turned in a second draft of the script to Marvel. A few months after that, they turned in a third. After a rumor that Ant-Man would be referenced in Thor, which he wasn't, Edgar Wright was once again interviewed about the film at Comic-Con 2011, now five years after the film was announced. In the interview, Wright once again told outlets that the film was moving along. Wright had a different vision for Ant-Man than what Marvel was doing. While characters were popping up in each other's films, eventually leading to a culminating on-screen moment when they team up, Wright wanted to create a film that existed on its own, that was only loosely connected to the rest of the universe. He wanted to create an in for people who weren't familiar with the other films, or with the decades of comic book stories as a whole. Then, finally, at the following year's Comic-Con, which was 2012, six years after the film's announcement if you're keeping track, the first test footage was screened to an audience in Hall H. Audiences absolutely loved it. Excitement for the project was back, and months later, Marvel announced a release date for Ant-Man in November of 2015. Unfortunately, even with the news of production moving forward, there were looming concerns over the project. Remember when Wright claimed that the film would only be loosely connected to the other Marvel films? Well, Marvel didn't exactly feel the same way. Now at that point, what year are we on now? 2013? Marvel was solidified as a Hollywood juggernaut, no pun intended. A major element of their success was the universe being as connected as it was. 
The feeling seemed to be that a property like Ant-Man may not have held up on its own without being connected to the greater universe. Feige once again ordered another rewrite of the script. Imagine the surprise of fans months later when the sequel to the highly successful Avengers was announced. And so was its villain, Ultron. Wait, what? What did we say earlier? How the hell could Age of Ultron focus on Ultron, a robot created by Hank Pym, if Hank Pym hadn't even been introduced in the MCU yet? Fans naturally just walked out of Hall H assuming that maybe this would be the way audiences would finally get to meet Ant-Man. But then a few minutes later in a different area of Comic-Con, Great. So at this point, Marvel appeared to value Hank Pym's creations more than they did Hank Pym. But, hey, at least production was moving forward, right? In the two months after the Age of Ultron announcement, Edgar and Cornish completed three more drafts of the Ant-Man script, addressing many of the studio notes they'd received from Marvel. Edgar was pushing hard to start production on the film, so it came as a surprise to many that it was Edgar himself who had the production delayed once again. In late 2013, Eric Fellner, a producer on Wright's movies Shaun of the Dead and Hot Fuzz, was diagnosed with cancer. Upon hearing the diagnosis, Wright approached Marvel about putting Ant-Man on hold. You see, Shaun of the Dead and Hot Fuzz were part of what Wright had been calling the Cornetto Trilogy, and Shaun, the first chapter in that trilogy, would not have been made or even possible if it weren't for the work and support of Fellner. Wright felt that he could never forgive himself if he didn't finish the trilogy while Fellner was still available to work and before, God forbid, his condition could get worse. Kevin Feige agreed to put Ant-Man on hold temporarily and Wright went on to make The World's End, closing out his successful trilogy. Finally, casting began for Ant-Man. After Joseph Gordon-Levitt turned down the role, Paul Rudd, aka the man who has never aged a day since Clueless, accepted the role of Scott Lang. Michael Douglas signed on to play the elder Hank Pym, with Evangeline Lilly cast as his daughter, Hope, and the release date was moved up to July 2015. For a brief moment in time, everything appeared to be back on track. But as the start date for production neared, Wright and Feige began to have disagreements. Feige demanded more rewrites to the script, which Wright despised but eventually agreed to do. The newest draft of the script actually included a post credit stinger at the end of Avengers Age of Ultron. It was ultimately never used, and the script had a new villain named Yellowjacket. Now, if you're a fan of the comics, that choice of villain may be a little confusing because Yellowjacket is an alias used by Hank Pym himself, but apparently this was a different Yellowjacket, and a different person altogether. A more evil person. One that was the result of almost a dozen script revisions. Not long after the additional script changes, sets were finally being built and more cast was announced in Michael Pena, Patrick Wilson, and Matt Gerald. Then, with mere weeks to go before filming, Edgar Wright was called in for a meeting with Marvel. The studio had decided to do a draft of the script without Wright or Cornish's involvement or supervision. This would be a cue for many filmmakers to step aside, and Marvel knew that when the decision was made. After all, this was Wright's baby. He was the writer, he was the director, he developed this film from the ground up and took an interest and fascination in a character that only Stan Lee himself seemed to love more. But Wright, to his credit, having been invested in this project since his original treatment was presented to Artisan 13 years earlier, decided to stick around. Unfortunately, he would have no say in who would be hired for rewrites, nor would he be permitted to oversee their work. In May of 2014, Wright received what Marvel considered to be the final script, and within 24 hours, he set up a meeting with Marvel executives to announce that he was leaving the project. Marvel informed news outlets that they and Wright had parted ways because of differences in their vision for the film. Marvel swiftly began floating other possible directors to the press, but the dominating aspect of this story was easily Wright's departure. In the following days, there was an outpouring of support. Cinematographer Bill Pope and composer Stephen Price both left the project. Joss Whedon, in a rare act of defiance to the people who helped make him a household name, tweeted a picture of himself holding up a Cornetto ice cream, the object of affinity in Wright's three major films, to show solidarity with the director. It's always tricky when we look back in hindsight, so this should be perfectly clear. This was a very bad look for Marvel. Possibly the worst look the studio has ever had. Well, at least until this whole debacle. Oh, the inhumanity. 
Adam McKay was approached by Marvel and his good friend Paul Rudd about taking over directing duties on the film, but he turned the production down the next day, although he did help tinker with the script enough to end up with a screenplay credit with Rudd. But the movie still needed someone in the director's chair, and quickly if it was going to hit its production start date in August of 2014. Among the other names considered or approached were Rawson Marshall Thurber, Nicholas Stoller, and Zombieland director Ruben Fleischer. But the job landed in the hands of Peyton Reed. It wasn't Reed's first time playing in the Marvel superhero sandbox. He was originally set to direct Fox's first Fantastic Four movie in the early 2000s before he departed the project over, you guessed it, creative differences. That still wasn't the end of the Ant-Man churn. Characters to be played by actors Kevin Weissman and Matt Gerald were reportedly cut from the script, and the movie's production delay caused Patrick Wilson to depart over scheduling issues just before Ant-Man's very long-awaited presentation at San Diego Comic-Con in 2014. Regardless, that summer, Ant-Man was finally on stage at Comic-Con. Corey Stoll was announced as the film's villain, Yellow Jacket, and the cast seemed to get along very well. Everything appeared to be going smoothly behind the scenes. Well, almost everything. Marvel was treated to one day of calm in the storm, as the following day Michael Douglas revealed that Pym's motivation throughout the movie would be the death of his wife, Janet Van Dyne, better known as the Wasp. This didn't sit well with fans, as a major female hero in the Marvel Universe would seemingly be put to death, not even on screen, just to make a male character sad. Before the day was through, the hashtag Janet Van Crime was trending on Twitter. By December of that year, principal photography on Ant-Man was wrapped. The film that took Edgar Wright over a decade to develop was finished filming within four months. After excitement around the teaser and trailer releases, the film finally opened on July 17, 2015, with $57 million for its first weekend, making it the second lowest opening for a Marvel film behind only 2008's The Incredible Hulk. And let's be honest, who even counts that film? Ant-Man went on to gross $180 million in North America and $339 million at the foreign box office, bringing its worldwide total to $519 million, on a reported cost of $130 million. Variety reported that the film succeeds well enough as a genial diversion and sometimes a delightful one, predicated on the rarely heated Hollywood wisdom that less really can be more. The New York Times claimed, this film is a passable piece of drone work from the ever-expanding Marvel Disney colony. However, some critics actually saw it as something refreshing in the midst of so many Marvel films that followed the same formula. RogerEbert.com said the film feels handmade, not Marvel factory approved. It reminded me of Zemeckis, when Zemeckis was fun. The New Yorker described the film as a bracing, giddy delight, a neoclassical comedy more closely related to Alfred Hitchcock's To Catch a Thief and to hectically skimpy B-movies than to the other members of the Marvel family. Despite the turmoil behind the scenes, the finished film still appeared to have Edgar Wright's fingerprints all over it. In January 2015, after the first teaser was released during an episode of Marvel's Peggy Carter TV series, Paul Rudd was quoted as saying that he credited Edgar Wright and Joe Cornish, and while he and Peyton Reed added a little to the script in the way of jokes and characters, that the idea, the trajectory, the goal, and the blueprint of it all was really Edgar and Joe. And to his credit, uncharacteristic for most studio heads, even Kevin Feige expressed regret over the situation. While he felt Wright wasn't as used to collaborating with the studio the way other filmmakers might have been, Feige claimed, the biggest disappointment for me is just the relationship. I like Edgar very, very much, and we were very close for many, many years. At one point, Feige even admitted that the only reason Ant-Man was made was because of Edgar Wright. For those wondering what Wright thought of the final product, you'll seemingly wonder forever. Edgar Wright never saw the finished film and claimed that he never would. He never even watched the trailer. He made his reasoning quite clear in an interview with Uprox, saying, It would kind of be like asking me, do you want to watch your ex-girlfriend have sex? Like, no, I'm good. While Wright stated that he would never be talked into bad-mouthing a film, he'd also never be talked into seeing it. When it all comes down to it, what was the major issue with Ant-Man? Ultimately, what made it such a troubled production wasn't all the years in development, and it wasn't the rewrites, though that was a product of the major problem. It was the MCU itself. The ever-growing and changing face of the Marvel Cinematic Universe was near impossible to adapt to. Each time script revisions were made, the universe grew in new and exciting ways, forcing a film that was meant to be loosely connected to adapt time and time again. So yes, the film got made. 
even though it wasn't a massive box office success by Marvel standards, it made decent money, and it brought Scott Lang into the universe for future appearances. In the end, everything seemed to work out, but as film fans, we can't help but envision what might have been.